Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm afraid that uh, we cannot uh, tell how the victory or loss uh, would look like in terms of uh, the conflict or tension uh, between West and Russia. Uh, first of all, because we are facing uh, a conflict of a very different nature that, uh, than uh, what we have been used to. Uh, starting with the fact that it is not a, a traditional uh, military uh, conflict. It is a, a rather a conflict or a clash of narratives about uh, how the societies uh, should be structured, governed. And uh, in that, I think, uh, the end game would be that the, uh, we don't uh, succumb to uh, the alternative narratives that are presented to European population, to Europeans. That we will not accept that uh, uh, democracy is not uh, the best way, or at least uh, what we know as the best way uh, for uh, organizing our social and political life. And that is more or less uh, a process rather than a state. And if I speak about like the security, uh, future of security, it is indeed uh, an ongoing dynamic uh, process uh, that uh, we need to contribute to. Uh, we cannot uh, reach any final status. Uh, I like to. <laughs> I like to use uh, uh, an example of uh, if you want 100% security for your kid, you would have to keep it in a cage. Uh, and this is <laughs> indeed not an outcome of what uh, uh, we want uh, to get into. Rather, we need to learn to adjust, uh, to adapt uh, to the challenges presented to us by Russia. It's uh, malign influences, it's a uh, hybrid operations. It is a uh, rather an adaptation process than a uh, victory or loss. Shall I keep it or shall I pass it on? No, it. Okay. Um, thank you very much and thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, it's a great pleasure. It's also a great excuse to visit Prague despite the pandemic. So thank you very much. Um, I will... Um, many greetings to our friends in Moscow. Thanks for um, the music entertainment. <laughs> okay. Um, in a true academic fashion, I will re reword the question. And I will not answer how the victory is going to look like, but I will answer how the peace is going to look like if we are in a, in a war with Russia. And in the study, in the academic study of peace, you can think about peace as a positive or as a negative. Um, uh, you can give it a positive or negative definition. And the, you probably all know the negative definition of peace is the one that where you talk about the absence of warfare. And the positive is the one where you actually have cooperative relations uh, with whoever the counterpart was. And if you think about Europe's relations with Russia, the last time we actually had good cooperative relations was sort of the 90s and early 2000s, which is a period that Russians considered to be the, the peak of the humiliation of Russia. And so that would give you a lot of skepticism for to what degree we can actually build a positive peace with our uh, big Eastern neighbor. Now, that message, and I know that this is going to be discussed a little later, but that message is not interpreted in the same way everywhere in Europe. So I think if we had someone from Berlin here, they would give a slightly different spin on this answer. So what you actually need to end up at the moment to fight for is the negative piece, and that is an absence of conflict and of open conflict. And then you may end up with, um, challenge, uh, with challenges such as construction of resilience um, as uh, uh, Minister Petrichek was talking about, and you can talk about uh, building um, societal structures that can actually withstand all sorts of um, malign influence, and um, that is not only in terms of um, disinformation, but also economic warfare and so on and so forth. And you can get somewhere, but it's also not the moment of positive peace. So in a way, my answer is like we can get somewhere but it's not going to be the type of peace that we would like to seek. 
Thank you. Uh, well, because you were talking about resilience, um, I would maybe approach this from the perspective of what would need to change or shift within Russia, not the West, for the West to consider it a win or, let's say, end state that is uh, desirable. I would say that uh, well, if we have a premise that the current Russia is controlled by a small group of oligarchs and intelligence services, uh, then what would need to happen is that we cut them off from power by freezing their assets, by freezing the assets of their families, and really depriving them of the possibility to influence us. And uh, then our uh, next step, ideally, would be supporting uh, the, uh, the leaders or those who would lead Russian system or regime towards democratic regime or as much as it is possible within, uh, within Russia's, uh, within Rus Russia's uh, atmosphere and uh, ending the interference uh, that is uh, happening within the European uh, Union soil. And that would be the end state for the win of the West. As for the defeat, I would say, well, pretty much on the same premise that we wouldn't cut off uh, the intelligence services and oligarchs, and they would continue uh, keeping uh, both their assets uh, here and the frozen conflicts surrounding them, and even joining forces more than uh, currently with China and overthrowing us not only, let's say, militarily or in the hard power, which uh, the EU does not really possess currently, uh, but also in the economic field, which Russia is currently not capable of, but together with China it would be. And the EU being currently the strongest economic bloc would cease to exist, and I would consider that a defeat. <clears throat> Okay, well, not to underestimate in any way the risks that are posed by Russia, I would say that the only type of war analytically that I'm willing to accept as taking place is a political war. So it, it's, it's a war that seeks to compel the opponent to do one's will without hostilities. I'm, I'm willing to accept that there is an element of wedge strategy to kind of to, to divide uh, the, the opponent, what Mikhail Vigel, you know, uh, relates to, to hybrid uh, interference, for example. So you know, the idea of there being a hybrid, hybrid war, that's something quite, quite fashionable, of course, and it's helpful to organize the resilience um, activities, to some extent at least, you know, because hybrid is a pretty floating signifier as well, but it's a bit of too perfect vision of the enemy and, uh, and, and carries on the anxiety of everything being connected and, and the capillary nature of the threat, an invisible one, which the society needs to be defended uh, against and, you know, suddenly everything is connected, you know, like the drilling in the wall and everything is illuminated. So I tend to agree with Michael Kaufman, among, among others, who argue that, you know, hybrid warfare is pretty poor theory of Russian foreign policy. But with this understanding of war as something political, when I think about your question uh, about, you know, what constitutes a victory, I think that for, for the Western alliance, the victory is a government in Russia that threatens neither neo-imperialist tendencies, nor does it implode and becomes kind of this kind of passive object of instability that spill, spills over. That's sort of the idea of victory that I have for the Western alliance. For Russia, it's incapacitating the Western alliance, which it sees as a threat, right? by political means, to reduce this threat, to possibly collect the lost lands from the erstwhile empire and the Soviet Union, and possibly restore the sphere of influence in, in Central Europe. But I think it's safe to say that in military terms, Russia doesn't have what it takes to, to achieve that objective, at least not now, just to think of the, of the logistics alone that has been, I think, uh, very, for me at least, you know, I'm not a military analyst, but illuminating piece by Alex Vershin in, in, in War on the Rocks, where he deals with the issue of logistics and what the logistical capacities of, of Russian Federation now can, can mean, for example, for the likelihood of the fait accompli scenarios in, in, in Eastern Europe. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I would actually like to follow this question now that we, you stated all some sort of end state for which we should strive. How, how, what are the instruments we have and how to employ them, how to achieve this? 
and especially I will be curious because we have the broad range of panelists who focus during their professional careers on different aspects of this problem and relationship with Russia, whether you would outline what role you would see for diplomacy and dialogue and to what degree this is uh, contributing to solving the problem or contributing to the problem, as many people would argue that engaging is essentially uh, promoting the bad behavior from Russia, which strives to be engaged. And I would also be curious, how would you uh, estimate the usefulness of sanctions or other instruments which we might use to achieve the end states you outlined and I would suggest going in the opposite order, so I would pass the microphone to Andre first. Okay, so first about non-coercive diplomacy. I mean, this is an institution of international society that has been around for quite some time. You know, uh, in the modern form, it has its roots in Renaissance, and it kind of its emergence uh, coincides with the emergence of early modern modern state, and it's an institution to kind of mediate estrangement. Uh, among you know political collectivities among among states, um, it helps us to understand e e each other each other better, and it's it's proven quite useful uh, over time. Uh, I don't think it's a weakness, and it's something that should be kind of a reward. You know, it should not be something someone has to deserve to be to be talking to to, to the other side. Um, as as for the for the sanctions. I think they're most effective the moment you threaten them and, and, and the moment you suspend them, or the moment that they are, they are in, in force. Um, there are various ways to evaluate you know, the effectiveness of sanctions. Obviously, the, the, the most common one is the extent to, to which sanctions can, can modify the target's behavior, but there are other you know, ways to, to do this. Of course, it's also about projecting identity, about asserting certain norms, like when, when, when we impose sanctions like the European Union does, you know, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, response to, to human rights violations, we don't really expect the human rights violations to, to, to stop, but we assert a certain certain norm. But in terms of modifying the object's behavior, I think uh, it's 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 been a little little tricky. And of course, you know, the sanctions can also impose certain costs on our, ourselves, and you know, we have to decide whether we are willing to to carry that cost in in the dependent uh, economies. I will follow up on that and uh, take it from the background uh, of my work, therefore, from the European Union perspective. Um, of course, if uh, we knew how to reach the end state, um, we would hopefully be on that track. However, I think that for the EU, the first step would uh, need to be a unification of their foreign policies more, or to some extent. Uh, personally, I am a fan of changing the unanimous vote to a majority vote or within the EU in foreign affairs. Um, and that, of course, uh, is uh, also applied to the sanctions. Uh, I will just have a quick example of uh, how it might completely destroy even our diplomatic attempts. Um, for instance, uh, nobody really likes uh, Lukashenko, yeah, like <laughs> nobody uh, in the whole world. Uh, so when there was the discussion about sanctions towards him, it was one of the quick quickest decisions that the EU ever made on sanctions. However, it has been blocked for a brief moment. It has been blocked by Cyprus. Why? Did Cyprus really like Lukashenko? No, they had a problem with Turkey, and they wanted to negotiate with the EU whether you know they don't have, uh, will do something about Turkey uh, while they are not uh, not approving these sanctions. And this is really imagine not being even Lukashenko. You know he. He is a different case. But his regime is financially supported by Putin, and without him, uh, the regime would be dead. And imagine Putin seeing this inability of EU uh, enact sanctions, even for just a brief moment, but enacted because of Cyprus or because of one country. Uh, this is really laughable uh, in a bad way. And I think that if we do not uh, let's say, and I mentioned it a bit, uh, uh, in my first answer, uh, that we have the soft power, we have the economic power, we are the strongest economic bloc in the world, 
I'm talking about the EU, uh, even stronger than the US. However, if we are not using it because we have 27 foreign policies and Josep Borrell, then of course we uh, will never be able to exert the power to the extent uh, that actually has uh, well any, any kind of influence. So I think that this really needs to be the first step and then we can talk about uh, what to do next and how to really, really change the narrative in Russia. Thank you very much. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion about sanctions so far, and, and Andre mentioned um, that if we do have sanctions, that that carries costs for us. Now, I have done some work on the impact of the Russian counter sanctions on the Dutch economy, and the Netherlands is a country where you know um, it's it's a major election issues. You wouldn't believe that people would say that we need to block the um, association agreement with Ukraine because we need to sell strawberries to Russia. Um, and when you look at the numbers, you actually see that after about two years, for two years, you actually see some sort of economic impact. And by then, the business is um, adjust. And by now, you don't see any negative impact of sanctions on the Dutch economy and Dutch companies. So um, I wouldn't, I, I like to say that the, the economic argument against the use of sanctions is one that is a very short-term argument, and, and if you are re actually really serious about the use of sanctions, it's a problem that can be overcome. Now, the bigger issue is, of course, should we talk to Russians? And, and I think there is the answer that it depends on who you want to talk to. Um, of course, on the, on the political level, you have a lot of issues that are very pragmatic and you need to talk to them about it. I mean, at the moment, for example, the US and Russia are going to talk about um, discussions about um, nuclear disarmament that may have impact on all NATO countries because they're going to be discussing also non-strategic nuclear weapons and the disarmament. That may mean that Czech Republic will need to negotiate with Russians about the Russian access to Czech um, air bases. Um, and like, there is a higher good in that. Um, the second point is um, there is a song by Sting from 80s, which is called Do Russians Love Their Children Too? And we have done work with Mikhail Smetana on uh, when we polled Russians about what they think about the use of force. And we find them actually pretty similar to Europeans. We, we, like, we find them way, we find them generally thinking about the use of force in a very similar way as people in Germany do. And so I think there is a lot of potential for people-to-people -people diplomacy and for sort of these um, lower level contacts um, because this is, the, Ru the Russians do love their children as much as we do. So, okay, on that note. Uh, actually, I would have uh, too much points for this kind of discussion, so I try to cut it short uh, and I would mention four. Uh, first, uh, uh, if we are to withstand the, the pressure uh, emanating from Russia, uh, we should start by understanding our uh, vulnerabilities better than we do right now. Uh, we are facing, uh, to a large extent, a very asymmetric conflict in a way that uh, Russia is behaving as a weaker. You know, I think Russia is, is aware about its weaknesses. And that's why it uh, invests uh, Russia invests a lot into asymmetric tools that are cheap for uh, for her, uh, and we should be uh, we should understand that uh, to improve, for example, uh, the societal resilience uh, of European Union. Uh, to work on what uh, uh, Madame Gregorova mentioned on strategic convergence to interpret the threats, risks in the same way. It is not the case right now. And I could continue on how to really build a stronger Europe vis-a-vis -vis the pressures from uh, actors like Russia, but uh, it would be for another debate. Uh, second point, I fully agree with, uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, Ondarkshow that uh, we should distinguish between uh, Russian regime and Russian society and uh, substantially improve our capacity uh, to reach Russian society uh, without uh, uh, filters uh, that are controlled by, uh, by Kremlin, uh, just improve people-to-people -people contact, uh, uh, work on 
supporting civil society in Russia, uh, independent media. Uh, and actually here I I see the role for Czech diplomacy as well because uh, we have promoted this approach at the European level that uh, while focusing on uh, sanctions, okay, let's focus on them, but uh, it is not a silver bullet. And let's be honest, I don't believe that the uh, uh, sanctions are silver bullets that would make, uh, change the uh, behavior of Russian regime. Uh, third point is uh, use existing instrument, uh, instruments for trust building that uh, remain, be it uh, uh, OECE instruments, uh, try to engage Russian, for example, on on working on the uh, modernization of Vienna document, on um, more transparency in terms of military uh, military operations, uh, and, and step by step try to create small bubbles of trust in the relationship with uh, with Russia, on which you can uh, start uh, more serious uh, diplomatic effort in uh, in the future. And last but not least. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, we ultimately need to understand uh, the nature of the Russian regime and the best way how to address it is to get rid of the dependence on the fossil fuels. Frankly, the best Russian in instrument we have at our hand is Green Deal. And as uh, soon as we uh, implement it, we will redefine the, our relationship uh, with Russian Federation and make probably the internal changes in Russia easier. Because at the moment, and I agree, uh, Russian regime, it's, it's a kleptocracy, the, it's state capture in a way where citizens have no right because they are not the source of legitimacy. It is a, a power struggle how to get control over the income stemming from the natural resources of Russia, which uh, make the regime not responsible towards its population. And it is a problem of all uh, countries rich in natural resources in a way. It's a kind of like a uh, resourced course uh, in practice. And if we make our part in getting rid of this uh, factor, I think it can allow for more democratic uh, Russia because any future government will rely much more on taxing the people, on the legitimacy stemming from the population, not from the uh, natural resources it's themselves. I believe that we overestimate the uh, effects of uh, Russian uh, influences on our societies. Uh, in a way, because we, we try to avoid admitting that uh, these are our internal problems, uh, the problems of our societies, and that uh, they are not caused by uh, external influences, but uh, only exploited by external influences. Uh, and if I'm to advise what to do, start working more uh, cohesive societies, uh, uh, focus on inequalities uh, in our societies that uh, are the cause, causes for uh, polarization in many ways. And uh, it can make us uh, much uh, stronger uh, uh, when it comes to facing, uh, facing uh, influences of Russia, China, and other uh, external actors. I think that we should 
try to see first the domestic sources of our problems than uh, blaming others that they are causing uh, some, some harm to us. Um, I could sign every single word that was said by uh, Mr. Pecicic. Um I 100% agree with everything that he said. And I think the consequence of that, and an important consequence of that is that actually, because if you, if you blame Russia for everything, even you know, for the fact that it's snowing today outside and it's really cold and the weather really, really sucks. If we blame Russia even for that, that takes away the agency for us, from us. And it also takes away the agency from what we, as voters, demand from our leaders. And so if we actually admit that there is something that we can do, we can also demand things from our leaders to, 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 to do them and to admit them. And that, of course, means that um, there's also the role for, um, for the, the people that we elect for, to actually do something about and for us to demand something. I want to talk about the second thing, which is um, there is a very important role both for the member states but also for, um, for the European Union in sort of trying to improve, for example, the economic resilience of Europe, to sort of avoid over-reliance in some very specific niche areas on either imports, exports, or investment from Russia and China. Um, you know, when you... I'm not sure if you've ever been um, to the, if you've been recently at the airport in, uh, in Athens, um, but there is a really big part of the airport that is basically um, devoted to regular flights to and from Beijing, and that reminds you that there is a, a port in Piraeus that is largely owned by a Chinese state-owned company. Um, and you can think whether that is really a smart thing to do. Um, I mean. We've seen this week in, in Uganda that these things can really turn very badly, and I don't expect Greece is going to turn into Uganda, but you can sort of think whether that actually does make sense. Because Europe is such an, such an attractive place for investment, both for Chinese and for Russians, I think we can be really smart about using our economic power, not only also to protect ourselves from the malign influence of other actors. Thank you. Not to disagree with my colleagues, I actually agree, but to take it a little bit from a different perspective, talking to various uh, politicians and people in office, I actually do think they are rather underestimating the influence of both uh, Russia and China. And uh, I mean it by that they do not understand what is actually the interference that is being posed, um, what tools they are using when you uh, are explaining how algorithms work or what is a troll farm. It's really a problem to explain it to them because to be honest, completely, some of them have even problems to connect to their computer. So of course they will have problems understanding this. And I think that uh, we don't have to say that, you know, Russia is responsible for, for the snow today. Um, but we can also uh, say that uh, uh, if there is actually a threat, which is a threat to our democracy, maybe this would kind of knock the politicians to start doing something about it and protect the democracy. And in the long term, it will actually help even interstate. Because, of course, this information and foreign interference, as was said, builds and fuels up already existing conflicts. But if the conflicts are already mild or non-existent at all, because there is a huge trust towards the government, towards the authorities by citizens, uh, then uh, there is nothing to fuel or nothing to, uh, to nudge even more. So I think that uh, it's very connected and of course we can't blame everything on someone else, but we also have to acknowledge that, that there is this kind of problem and that, that we need to operate on all the levels to, to tackle it. Yeah. And what, what can I add to this? Um, I think we are, we are seeing various tools of interference uh, in play. It's not so difficult not, not to see them. And especially, as was mentioned before, um, they exploit the, the existing vulnerabilities. So where there are more vulnerabilities, we can perhaps expect there, there, there are more 
uh, activities of this sort. And I mean, we're seeing these these tools in play, and I think it's it's fairly sound to expect that they have some effect. But we do not have you know, convincing tools to to assess the, this effect. But maybe it's really asking too much. Maybe you know we should approach this by way of, sort of abduction, you know, of inference to the best explanation, you know, not not to calculate, you know, it. uh, it's it's difficult to say, you know. <clears throat> Really, you know, uh, uh, this very, very precisely. But we can ask, you know, is this the best possible explanation, you know, uh, to, to to some 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 sort of to some sort of uh, outcome, uh, or are there, you know, other more plausible explanations than than Russian Russian interference? Um, yeah, I guess I'll <laughs> leave it there. It's a tough question. And I'm, I'm going to get another one, I guess, now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I might be a bit far away. Sorry for that. Oh, okay, I can see the difference. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, now, you, you already mentioned, because this question was, to a degree, a question about threat perception phrased through other words. And uh, uh, Ms. Gregorova already uh, uh, mentioned the need for creating more common European approach. Nowadays, there is a process of strategic compass within the EU trying to do some review of threats. There will be also a new strategic concept in NATO, probably. And I wanted to ask you, how far did you think we come in uh, um, blending or merging threat perceptions and or building consensus of, on threats within Europe uh, with regard to Russia especially? Because there was also mentioned Peros in Athens, which is then again another example of differing perceptions of these threats. So I would again ask Andrzej to start. Let me just quickly follow up with one more thought that I that I got. I, I think it's very hard to see, you know, uh, kind of clear success of um, the, the, these interferences. But we can sometimes see them fail, and I, I think we we saw them fail in in this country in April. Uh, I, I think any consortium with Rosatom present stood a decent chance to get the the Tamalin nuclear tender. But then, because of some, some something surfaced, the, this very reckless op operation by by the by the Russian military intelligence, which was kind of completely unrelated, but which in this kind of paradigm that we that we have is part of this hybrid hybrid war machine, you know, uh, the the situation changed completely. So sometimes we we, we see we see it fail, uh, but if. It has been successful in, in something, and uh, this is, I think, beyond beyond reasonable doubt. It's in terms of mobilizing the, the Western security apparatuses to uh, to counter this threat and to sort of strategically orient its its, its practice uh, around it. And we we've seen a lot of uh, activity. We've seen an institutional build up, the hybrid fusion cell in the EAS, the Stratcom East, uh, the framework uh, positions, uh, the EU playbook. Playbook, the council decisions on on COVID. I mean, there, there's quite quite a lot these days. And then you mentioned the strategic compass and the hybrid toolbox in the making. And uh, I'm I'm pretty certain that that the strategic compass will not lead to the strategic convergence or strategic culture or whatever. But you know, maybe it's one step in a, in, a, in a process that will take time. But I think it's really important to uh, to follow and and you know try to reach as much of this convergence uh, as as possible. Which, however, also. It, uh, I think places a demand on on us to be able to understand what others, or our partners and allies, what they think and how they think about these threats. I mean, we have a certain view. I mean, no, not a unified view in this this country, but you know, possibly we are more skeptical regarding Russia than you know some of other mem member states. But maybe they have their reasons too why they don't see things uh, the same way, and we don't. We can't just expect them to to become realist like 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 us, you know, uh, in a in a day or so. 
Uh, well, you are much more optimistic than I am today, but uh, yes, you, you said it definitely. All the all the tools and build up and the strategic compass recently are are let's say a showcase of uh, the EU's common will to to proceed. However. As I already mentioned today, uh, I am a bit pessimistic in uh, uh, regards to, to the national foreign and defense policies. I think that the threat perception is quite aligned. Uh, every country sees what is the problem, and they have their intelligence services and their critical infrastructures and their build-up. Some of them are not so quick to adapt. Not everybody has NUKIP, as uh, we do, for instance. Uh, but they are catching up. The cybersecurity domain is somewhere where, we are, uh, where everybody is catching up. However, uh, it's still uh, 27 uh, national uh, security policies. And especially in the field of security, it's something that each country is holding very close uh, and dear and doesn't want to either share. And there is several, apart from these uh, hybrid tools, etc., there is already several projects that are trying to overcome this and are trying to tell them, well, let's share our know-how, let's share what we know about various threats um, and issues, and uh, let's build a resilience thanks to that uh, more efficiently and f uh, fast. It's not working, not working yet. Um, Nations are uh, national countries are still very secretive about it, and even though I understand it, it also harms them in the long term because we are not resilient uh, fast enough and uh, well efficiently enough. So this is a problem that I think we need, we would need to overcome again. But I don't want to repeat myself again and again and sound like uh, I want a European Federation yesterday or something like that. It's just uh, that this direction is, uh, in my point of view, unavoidable. If uh, if we do not want uh, you know to go back decades. Thank you. Um, I have only a very short thing to add, which is um, I would subscribe to both views that we have gone a long way and also that we have a long way to go. Um, but I just want to say that um, I find it pretty remarkable that you wouldn't find a leading politician in Europe from a mainstream party today that would not, for example, say, or that would deny that, that Russia poses a challenge to Europe. And that was not the case five years ago. So I think, in a way, there is some sort of a convergence. Um, and I'm, I, I, I mean, of course, we're not as far as some of us being your federalists would like to be, but also that we are not as far as we would want to be from the pure point of view of efficiency. But I do see that there has been a political convergence, at least on the highest political level, in terms of, of, of certain threat perceptions um, being in place. It is difficult to add uh, something uh, that hasn't been said, but uh, I would uh, probably start by stressing that uh, strategic convergence is not uh, only about persuading the others uh, to look at the problems uh, through your eyes. It is also about uh, accepting their uh, interpretation of threats. And uh, here I believe uh, it is our task as well to understand, uh, for example, the southern flank of the European Union about uh, their threat perception which is very different uh, to ours. And uh, Russia certainly is not dominating uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, debate in Spain, Portugal, maybe Italy. So uh, it is necessary maybe to, to really be ready to accept that it will be a compromise. It is not uh, that we will have a, a wish list of our own only. I would maybe turn around and uh, look at the similar discussions that are taking place in NATO right now. And uh, even in organization that has a relatively robust strategic culture, uh, we see that uh, we are not yet capable of uh, looking at the problems uh, in a similar way. Uh, I would only recall uh, last year debate with Turkey about uh, <laughs> actually the same topic, how far we share the understanding of threats of our partners. And I have to admit that we 
for example, are not ready in this country to accept that Turkey has a legitimate concerns about its own security, which are very different to ours. And uh, let's be honest, we haven't much, we haven't contributed much to to addressing Turkish uh, strategic concerns. So that's probably also uh, necessary to understand. Uh, we cannot be selfish in that, and uh, it is about a serious consideration how we are capable of uh, of providing solidarity to our uh, allies and partners, which uh, hasn't been always the strongest. Uh, strongest uh, side of uh, our uh, diplomatic uh, and political effort here. Okay, so you ended up with uh, our partners and allies, and I would like to follow that with my last question of this opening round of questions. So then I will yield the floor to you, the audience, to ask their questions, but I would like to finish this up with the topic of today's interest, or contemporary interest, which is obviously a threat to Ukraine. There is a lot of debate nowadays that Russia is seriously preparing for possibility of another round of invasion of, obviously, points of view differ on as to what scale that operation would have. But my question would be, first, what can we do, or what are we doing to prevent it? And what are we ready or able to do if we fail to prevent it? So. Uh, it is true, and uh, the recent statements by uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg confirms that uh, we are facing enormous uh, threat uh, at our eastern flank that might be for the first time to have a large-scale conflict, military conflict, uh, at the European territory involving major powers. And uh, here I would uh, again uh, return back to what, uh, what the diplomacy can do here. Still have some time, most probably a couple of months, to prevent uh, any serious accident to happen. Uh, starting with uh, really reincorporating the measures on transparency. Uh, I believe that the, here the U.S. Uh, and major European uh, partners have a have a role to play. Uh, we have seen already the U.S. diplomacy uh, activate engaging with Russians on the issue. Second, uh, uh, I believe that deterrence here uh, has to be considered. What kind of effective deterrence? Uh, we, we as a NATO or we as a European Union can can uh, deploy, and uh, I'm afraid we are not in uh, in really defining where are our possibilities uh, on that, because uh, we are planning, we are discussing, we are considering future strategies, but not tailoring it for this particle. Uh, particular tension uh, that, uh, that is emerging again uh, at uh, the Ukraine and Russian borders. And if I may just to conclude by, by stressing that uh, this is clearly something worse of, uh, of discussing more in the future in Europe, because uh, uh, we are probably shifting from a military concept of, uh, of uh, external operations uh, back to territorial defense uh, concept uh, with major uh, major uh, European partners already working on improving their capabilities and future uh, future possibility uh, future uh, capabilities uh, to withstand uh, large-scale conflict such as France and others that are building <laughs> what we call traditional military forces uh, in uh, in numbers. Thank you very much. Um, so there is a, there is this motto for um, diplomacy, which is speak softly and carry a big stick. Um, so um, in the spirit of what Minister Pecicek already said, um, if you actually are serious about speaking softly and carrying a big stick, then you need to find out what the big stick is. Um, and there is ample historical evidence which 
shows that if you talk to people softly and you explain them what unspeakable cruelty, mainly economic ones, you're going to commit to them if they go forward with their steps, um, that may actually make them to rethink things. So if we, we, may, um, we may actually invest time and think about if this is actually going to happen, what are we going to, what are we willing to do to, and to, to make sure that, you know, that the other party is punished or co constrained at least. Um, I think for many countries in Europe, um, and not only in Western Europe, but I've heard also people from Central Europe talking about this, that they, they often think that this is an issue for the US and maybe for Germany and France, that this is not a question for them. And I think in many Central European countries, they would realize that whatever we saw a few weeks ago on the border between Belarus and Poland would be just like, you know, um, incomparable to what we would see if actually a large scale conflict emerged in Ukraine. Um, so there is a lot of there is a lot of salience for European countries to think about this, and also that should give an impulse to actually put some serious thinking into um, how would we react. And I know that this was an easy way for me to get out of this question. Well, I wanted to talk about the increased cost uh, perceived for an action, but uh, holding a stick is much better term. So please remember that. That's uh, uh, so it's uh, difficult to follow up on that because I think everything has been uh, rather uh, rather said. Maybe in a more concrete, uh, practical examples, uh, the EU can hold a, a concrete list of names and their families and their assets that would be expelled from the EU. That their assets would be frozen within in the EU and this could be even uh, like a public thing so that the perceived cost or the stick is very visible and they really know uh, what would uh, what would be the cost and uh, yeah just to mention um, maybe because we were talking about the strategic compass um, I do not think that the stick that the EU is holding should be a military power not currently and not in probably the next 10, 10 years uh, and however that is also something that the U.S. currently covers quite well, uh, at least for Ukraine. So that's why I think we are all talking mostly about the economic uh, sanctions and sticks, because uh, that's what the EU can do now, right, right now. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to go for, for a second back to what uh, Tamar, Tamar said before. I, I think, you know, Turkey has legitimate, you know, strategic concerns, but I think, you know, they, they would have been much more in peace had they not taken some disastrous decision in 2011 regarding regarding Syria. So uh, I think they partly, you know, are <laughs> responsible for that. Uh, but, but, but what matters is, is I think, empathy. You know, uh, we, we should have empathy uh, Regarding our allies, but but also our enemies, you know, and empathy is not appeasement. Empathy is not compassion. You know, it's just you know, trying to see see the world through through others' eyes. And I, I think we're missing that even when it comes to the strategic debate, uh, either in the EU or uh, or NATO. And regarding Ukraine, I think much has been said already. I mean, deterrence would be key, provided we don't want that war to happen. Punishment, denial, bolstering. Ukraine's capacities, raising the cost of intervention, then you know, uh, punitive measures. But the, the key issue is 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 of political will and resolve. How how far are we willing to go? when we have this clear asymmetry of preferences. Um, the U.S. and Russia have anyway, uh, and you know uh, that I think is, is is the key here. What I I mean, we don't want this war to happen for various reasons, but. I'm not also sure that Russia wants that war, <laughs> too. You know that it's uh, it's really decided to attack. I mean, there's this uh, article in in the current issue of International Politics Journal, uh, uh, which is on the strategy of testing, uh, and the idea is that you know we're we're being tested. I mean, we have Russia, this revisionist power that is not happy with how the world is. You know, it's it, it's neighborhood, how its its neighborhood is. And it, it tries to revise it in, in a way, and, and it, 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 it does certain things to, to, to get information about how we respond to, to certain things, you know? Uh, and, and these activities may be a useful way for it to, to, to gather information that otherwise is not you know, readily uh, available, and then perhaps you know, uh, work with it uh, in, in the future. And I think one plausible way of reading what Russia is doing regarding Ukraine, and it has been since the beginning of this year, uh, is, is this. 
Okay, so thank you all very much for these opening speeches. Um, now I will uh, give up one of my microphones uh, and I would ask the audience, you had quite some time to think of uh, questions you would like to ask, certainly more time that I gave uh, our panelists to prepare their answers. So yeah, first question, please. Thank you. I would like to ask you about uh, the perception of uh, the diplomatic language in regard to Russia and China, because thank you for the discussion, it was very, very interesting, but I think that the, the root cause of why are we dealing with these things is still a bit lost on us. I think that uh, the main cause is that we cannot properly interpret the Russian and Chinese diplomatic language. I think we should treat them as such as they are talking to us. They are talking to us as adversaries. How do we know that? Know that? Because they are calling us adversaries, calling us enemies. And I think that this should not be lost on us. We need to treat them as such as they have stated. They have prepared the game. They have laid out the board as as per as we are their enemies. We need to address and change our diplomatic language to, to assert that. I uh, know that uh, it has maybe been lost on you uh, that uh, the certain, uh, the newest coronavirus uh, variant has been named Omicron. Uh, we, has, we have skipped a certain letter of alphabet, Greek alphabet is C. And uh, why didn't we uh, call the newest uh, coronavirus variant the C variant, as not to offend our um, Chinese eternal leader, as he has been basically crowned? This is perceived as weakness. This weakness will be exploited, because we are allowing us to be exploited. Uh, the Euro-Atlantic society is very good at drawing red lines, but it is even better at the letting others to cross those red lines and do nothing about it. We need to be more assertive. We need to take, uh, at least change our language to match those of our opponents. We are in conflict because uh, the Russians and the Chinese uh, perceive it as such. They perceive it as a conflict of powers. If you look at their narrative and outlook at our society, it is depraved by them. I know that the Russians love their children, as the Sting said, and sang a very good song. <laughs> but uh, they're also perceiving us as uh, being corrupt and weak and too rich for our own good. So, of course, they're exploiting our differences and exploiting the problems that root in our society. We cannot blame them for that, but we have to understand that we are enabling them to do so. Thank you. Sorry, would you, would you just rephrase what was the question? <laughs> just, just, just briefly, yeah. <laughs> sorry. So uh, the, root, uh, the root question was, uh, how do we, or are we willing to rephrase our diplomatic language in regard of Russia and China to be more assertive, not to... Feel length. Oh. So Thank you. who would like to respond to? Uh, just quick, quickly, I, I think if there were a letter in the Greek alphabet, Boris or, or Joe, then I think there's a decent chance that we would skip it uh, as well. Um, no, I, I don't think we should take uh, everyone literally. I think if we, we did as, as, as humans, I mean, we wouldn't have been here for, for a very, very long time. I think you are asking to some extent a very interesting politological question whether uh, strong leaders can exist in democracies. Because uh, of course that Xi and Putin are, uh, well, they are very strong and they can also do much more than our democratic European or even US leaders um, to some extent, yes, let's, let's not go into US, let's stay in the, the EU. And uh, 
uh, of course, then uh, in comparison, it might then see like uh, not only Putin, but even small country Lukashenko, you know, can do whatever, and we can't really react because we have uh, the, uh, uh, the the democracies and uh, the leaders that need to first ask for permission to do something. But I do not think, and I agree uh, with Andre that uh, we shouldn't really let go of our democracies just to win wars or so, you know, because then we lose them. Uh, strong leaders do win wars, probably, but they also lose democracies, and I don't want this kind of exchange. So I would prefer not to change the diplomatic language as much as to adapt somehow on the situation. And, well, of course, not to be cowards and not to cower in front of uh, these uh, adversaries. And by the way, the EU already uses this kind of language. It, it calls China and Russia uh, adversary uh, often in their resolutions and uh, reports. Um, but also just, you know, pretty much waging a diplomatic war is also a, not a solution. Let's look at China. It, you know, decided now. So sorry for last remark. Uh, you can see that right now China is not really how to say it, diplomatically skilled, or it might not seem like that because it causes all these kind of uh, um, divisions and problems and uh, threatening our diplomats and even our, you know, uh, head of Senate and MEPs putting on blacklist. Why are they doing that? They don't they see that it's not working? No, they actually decided it uh, when, you know, there has been a new like decision for the next five years, and they can't change it. So they need to continue this uh, very aggressive and non-functional diplomacy. And uh, I think we can learn from them that this is not the way. Uh, I would first a uh, little bit disagree. I think we are already changing uh, our rhetoric about uh, China and Russia. Look at uh, the strategic documents of NATO, even EU. I would say only that what we need is maybe to realign probably our reading of the situation between the US and Europe, uh, especially when it comes to China. I think this will be a big part of the puzzle for the debate over the NATO uh, strategic concept because we are not yet on the same page. There is still big difference between uh, the perception of uh, US, of China, as a challenger, and uh, EU. If I'm also to bring in a little bit of history, I would be careful about, because uh, I'm taking out of the equation Russia, because it's, uh, as Andrei said, uh, it's a uh, revisionist power, with all its uh, complexities and complexes. and. Uh, I think that what is the major challenge is China. It is energetic power. It's, I would say, you can learn from a uh, history of uh, American-Japanese relationship uh, before World War II. It was, again, a rising power that wanted to know what is its place in the world. And the calculations of the leadership in, uh, in Japan before the war was not clearly in favor of going for an open conflict with the US or with a challenge US hegemony, uh, emerging hegemony at the time. And the same applies probably to China as well. We, do, we should understand better what is Chinese strategic outlook. How would China uh, see its future role in the world? How can we create a multiple world without uh, the complexities that can result in accidental conflict as well. But uh, doing that doesn't mean that uh, we uh, blind ourselves uh, to real threats posed by China uh, to the Western, uh, Western democratic communities. I think it's clearly the need for for calling the uh, calling it uh, with the right words, uh, but I would still hesitate to say that we should go directly to say we are enemies and we are going to fight, because it is a more or less tautological. Then you are clearly defining where you end, because there is no other option for you then.
So a lot of questions. Yeah, quick. We already know uh, at least uh, what uh, their outcomes are because the strategic papers from the Chinese military and the People's Republic and the Communist Party of China have been made, made available. And uh, the openness of Xi Jinping's uh, ambition uh, is uh, very remarkable and uh, worth of study on itself. But if you look at the Chinese strategic doctrine and uh, their uh, their documents, uh, they are telling us that by 2040s and 2050s they want to be the dominant power in the Indo-Pacific and replace the United States as the hegemon in the area. Okay, so if I might reclaim some degree of sovereignty over the panel, um, uh, thank you for the remark, but I hope there will be time for more remarks at the end, and I hope there will be time for multiple questions from a single person from audience. But I would still ask you to try to phrase brief, sharp questions for our panelists, and you can even indicate if you would be interested from res about response from any particular panelist. So go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Krzysztof Kuczmasz. I'm junior research assistant at PRCP. I have a one very uh, specific question for Madame Gregorova, I believe. Um, it uh, concerns the, the intriguing idea of changing the system of voting for, I believe it's Council of European Union uh, for, the foreign, uh, for the foreign matters. So um, considering the narrative of the so-called hybrid uh, influence states that the European Union is taking our individual sovereignty from each of the states away, uh, wouldn't this change of voting system, which basically stops having veto for some states, uh, kind of prove the argument of the, of the of let's say hybrid influence that the EU is taking away the sovereignty? Because the moment when you create uh, just the, you know, allow for the majority votes to win, you basically say, okay, there's gonna be a core which agrees, and then the rest of the states will kind of lose in this matter. So um, what would be your answer to this, uh, let's say, uh, devil's argument? Thank you very much. Uh, well, of course, I cannot uh, persuade those who uh, ideologically perceive it as uh, something unacceptable, you know, as, uh, for instance, my colleague, Mr. Zahradil. Uh, I wouldn't persuade him, no matter what. Um, <laughs> I tried. <laughs> um, however, uh, I think that uh, in this uh, talk, and it kind of emerges from our discussion today, um, we need to focus also on the long term. Mm, I, I think that everybody really sees that the, the world changed and we really lived in a globalized world. And it's not just a matter of uh, internet or, or, or something, you know, the borders are really uh, dissolving and I think that within this framework, we cannot pretend that something like a sovereign state is the um, best option for protection of its citizens only. Uh, and even those who are claiming like that sovereignty is important, they still participate in uh, organizations such as NATO. So uh, it's not about giving part of your sovereignty or part of your something from the national state uh, to someone else. It's just pooling your capabilities to be more resilient together. And that's, that's my like main argument uh, because I do not see a way in which one uh, member state or one EU state is stronger than 27 together, you know. And if someone thinks that's uh, uh, taking their sovereignty away from them, I would say, well, no, it's protecting your sovereignty from the uh, outside adversaries. Uh, okay, well, there is qualified majority voting in many many areas, right, uh, of, of, of EU policies already. So this is this is not a revolutionary thing. Uh, at the same time, I'm perhaps more skeptical than you, Marketa. I, I I know how frustrating it must have been to see Cyprus blocking. Uh, the decision of, of, of sanctions against Belarus. We really wanted that. We, we, we knew what was going on in, in, in Belarus. Really frustrating, right? But what the next time it concerns suspension of the sanctions against Russia? You know, some, something that, that is also dear us. After all, I mean, just 
structurally speaking, we are a smaller state, right? And um, this reduces our, our you know, bargaining power uh, in, 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 in EU, EU policy. So I would be, I, I would be a little more skeptical. I, I mean, if we want to have effective foreign policy, foreign and security policy of the European Union. This is probably uh, the way to go, but we might also want to first ensure that the, like the big guys would be responsive to our uh, you know, needs. And we, we, I think, the, take the example of migration, right, in 2015, when we were outvoted, right, on this. And it really had some very negative political fallout, uh, I think, and it was not very sensitive and had, you know, the, the big member states being more more sensitive than, than perhaps you know could have been done otherwise. So in in principle, I, I think QMB is, is a good way to go. But for us as, as the small member state, you know, we, we should be really careful and perhaps make <laughs> some some kind of uh, blocks, you know, protections first. I will just quickly react. I do not think we are in a disagreement. I uh, do think that um, with uh, with the strategic papers such as this the strategic compass and uh, other hybrid uh, tools, toolboxes, etc. We are actually trying to converge where we agree, where we disagree, and trying to involve everyone. So, so yes, I absolutely don't think that tomorrow we should establish a majority vote, you know, and go on with it, and it would be amazing. No, yeah, it would be terrible, actually. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that we need to have this in mind as the long-term goal towards which we go, and with that we uh, adapt or our other policies and relationships among the uh, EU member countries. But yeah, thank you for mentioning it. It's important to say it because uh, it might seem like, you know, with this uh, it would be a great change, but uh, no, it might be dangerous. Okay. So, thank you. So, another question? Sorry. Yep. Please. Um, thank you to the panelists. It's very exciting to be here. Um, I have a question for Mr. Petricek. Um, if I understood it correctly, you mentioned the Green Deal and the diverging from the use of Russian fossil fuels as an effective tool to combat Russian influence. Uh, and I'm no expert, uh, but I have two questions regarding a statement. Firstly, uh, isn't there a possibility that with lower economic integration with the rest of Europe, Russia could become less cautious and less bothered with the use of aggression against states such as Ukraine or the Baltic states? And secondly, Russian atomic energy influence has been growing steadily in Europe, despite certain hindrances, for example, like in the Czech Republic, um, uh, in countries such as Finland, uh, Hungary, Belarus, and Turkey. And with Rosatom pushing the European community to add nuclear energy to the list of green sources of energy, couldn't the dependence of certain countries on Russian uh, fossil fuels be simply replaced by uh, the dependence on nuclear power coming from Russian-controlled power plants? Thank you. Uh, look, uh, first of all, I meant that uh, if we are to change Russia, Russian politics, internal politics, you need to understand the role fossil fuels play, play in, uh, in Russian politics. Because, uh, look at the Russian budget. The Russian elite is not responsible to its population because they don't need them. They need oil and fossil uh, and natural gas to sell to us. The same applies to other uh, countries rich in fossil fuels. Be it Gulf, Nigeria, and others. This is not endemic to Russia only. But uh, if we are get rid of that, it will certainly force Russia to reconsider its its governance model. Because they will start to need new economy as well. An economy where the citizens will play a role. They will not be objects of the governance system they, they have in Russia, but they will be active parts of it. Because more and more, Russia will rely economically and, and in terms of state budget on uh, normal taxation, as we in Europe do. On uh, issue of interdependence, look, 
I have been present to debate about how the interdependence uh, between EU and Russia will work in favor of good relationship. It never survived the, uh, the proof of the da daily, daily life. Even though we are interdependent, we see that uh, it is not preventing Russia from <laughs> using hybrid uh, and other forms of uh, of uh, pressure on uh, European societies, and including using the uh, energy weapon in that. So I think let's, let's look at evidence, and the evidence says interdependence is not preventing conflict to emerge. And in contrary, and it is not only in terms of EU-Russia -Ru relationship, it was considered in 19, 1913 that the interdependence of all the European countries was to prevent any future wars. One year before the outbreak of the First World War. Uh, so I think that the concept of interdependence was, uh, has some serious faults in itself. And uh, in terms of uh, and the qu question about like, the role of atomic energy, uh, it might be the outcome. On the other hand, uh, atomic energy is not representing a continuous uh, revenue for the Russian state budget. It is not that uh, we would uh, rely on, uh, uh, Russia would rely on providing us with some atomic energy uh, solutions. It is not as big as, uh, as we consider. Look, even Temelin, or Dukovani rather than Temelin, because Temelin will never happen. But uh, in terms of Dukovani, it is uh, a project for some seven, eight billion euros, maybe 10 billion euros, uh, maybe okay, then 15 at the end, uh, but in 20 years. It is nothing compared to annual sales of gas and especially oil, because oil represents the majority of the state revenues for Russian Federation. And my point was, that look at the economic structures that underpin authoritarian regimes, that allow them to do what they do. Be it in Gulf, North, Af North Africa, China, and elsewhere. These are different stories. If you understand also what uh, we discussed about China, what is the economic part of the story? It is more troubling for us than what we see in Russia. Russia is an elephant on the very weak legs. Okay, so any more questions? Okay. Thanks a lot. I'm Michal Parizek from the Peace Research Center Prague as well. I have a question to all of you if you wish to address that. I mean, um, Especially Michal and Tomáš, they've been mentioning, and, and I think this is kind of starting to become part of the common talk about resilience and about hybrid warfare and all that, that the key thing is uh, resilience and it's kind of social cohesion and ultimately also economic success in the long term, like being able to develop and keep up with the technological development. You don't want the other side to have better technology, better AI, whatever, at a given point in time. And I'm wondering, like in the long term, we are basically starting to talk about societal cohesion and economic prospects, economic success as being tools for security. We are kind of starting to securitize these areas, right? And I'm, I mean, I understand the political dynamics behind that, but I wonder whether you see some danger in that as well, because we are basically starting to increasingly talk about economy and social policy as being tools for national security. And this is something that I think is kind of distinctly illiberal, or I think it might be. I would be interested in whether you agree with that, whether this is a danger that should be addressed, or that should be spoken about, right? Because we are cr very critical of Chinese and Russian state capitalism, the things that has been just discussed, right? The intermeshing of politics with, with economics, with business, right? And we might be tempted to kind of follow Russia and China at least some, to some degree in the coming decades. I'm talking about like prospect of 20, 30 years in the same direction in kind of countering their pressure. And I wonder whether this is something that uh, you see as a danger or whether there is an easy way out of this dilemma. If I may start, because I grabbed the microphone. Um, 
I think that's a very interesting question, uh, especially given how, how the EU started and on what basis and why, uh, because of course, uh, there has been a will not to repeat the, the horrors of uh, the first two world wars. And uh, they decided that one of uh, the be uh, best ways is to uh, interconnect and cooperate in economic fields so much that it would not be uh, not be uh, uh, not bring any advantage to to wage war against each other. And uh, I think that it, this is a little, little bit similar uh, thing because uh, it's again bl uh, bringing economy topic into the security. It's nothing new, but of course, correctly, you are talking about success, which is a new thing. And we can also see in uh, the pandemic, I wouldn't even call it post-pandemic yet, world that uh, uh, economic success or growth is not something that we can expect to be there forever. Uh, whereas the economic cooperation and interconnection is something that I, uh, I think we can uh, see forever. So I would agree with you that it's a danger to focus on just one part, which is the success, and I would uh, advise or be happy if we also focus on what brought us together in the first place and try to, try to let's say, help each other in that regard. Of course, in the EU, it's uh, happening a lot. You know, there, there are no tolls on the borders, there are efficiently no borders for business people, etc. But uh, even with other democratic parts of the world, uh, this would be definitely something that on which we can count on, even if uh, some parts of the world uh, are, are going down. This was already mentioned, actually, a great example of Greece and China buying off uh, some assets and uh, coast areas uh, of Greece. I think this should be unacceptable for the EU or for any democratic partner of the country, because uh, it's not endangering just Greece, endanger it's endangering all of us because we are interconnected. Now we need to also proceed our businesses through their uh, harbors. So, uh, so yes, <laughs> I would agree with you, and I would say let's interconnect more and protect our connections. Um, you asked for an easy answer, an easy way out, um, and I'm afraid I'm not going to offer that. Um, but I want to engage with one part, which you said um, at the end, is this distinctly illiberal? And I, I'm not sure I agree with that view. And I don't agree with that view for two reasons. The first one is, you mentioned this economic, um, economic reasons. And I don't think none of us is basically saying we need to mobilize economy to support war production, you know, like Germany 30, 1930s. Um, I think what people often, when they talk about economic resilience, they basically talk about um, sort of stepping a little back from the laissez-faire economics and, uh, and super open markets that we have seen for the last, I don't know how many, 20, 30 years, you're the expert. Um, and, and I think that may be a little bit about the dialing back the, the neoliberal economy, but I don't think we're, we're switching back to, you know, the the, the Chinese style economics where we don't allow foreigners to buy assets and, and whatnot. The second point about um, societal resilience, I actually don't think we need to build societal resilience. And if we talk about, for example, the diminishing or building societal resilience, we don't need to build it because the Russians are coming. I think we need to build societal resilience because we are going, we are have, we have half, I don't know how about you, but I come from a country where half of the people believe that COVID doesn't exist. Um, and, sorry? <laughs> and, 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 you know, like when you see on, on screen uh, people sort of um, protesting that wearing a face mask is, you know, uh, the same as being sent to a Russian gulag, then you believe that this is the reason why we need to build societal resilience. Even if the Russians were not coming, we need that for survival as a society. So. Uh, Michal, I agree with one part, disagree with the rest probably. Uh, first, I agree that uh, kind of like artificial securitization is uh, dangerous in itself as well. Like to make anything part of a security debate because of uh, usually political motifs is not uh, wise and uh, 
I agree that uh, uh, to securitize everything is is, is not uh, an option for for European democracy. Uh, on the other hand, I agree with uh, Michal Ondarcho uh, about uh, the fact that uh, uh, we are not going by building social uh, societal resilience, turning Europe into uh, alternative China. Actually, it would be actually the. <laughs> The outcome would be what we try to avoid. But uh, building on the evidence we have available, the most resilient societies are actually, for example, Scandinavians, the most liberal democratic countries in the world, probably. Because at the same time, they avoided the trap of neoliberal solutions. The level of inequalities in their societies is relatively low. They allow huge participation of uh, citizens in public and political life. And that's part of the story. We are, and I fully agree that we are not building resilience because of uh, Russia or because of China. We are building it because of our, ourselves, because of the future challenges we will, our societies will, will face, not only COVID. Uh, we will certainly need to adjust to uh, new technologies that would transform uh, European economy or probably global economy uh, to climate change. These are considered threats. I would uh, try to avoid uh, using uh, kind, of, kind of like climate urgency uh, narrative, but rather use the narrative, look, uh, we want to build a just society or a society that is juster than this one. And it's part of the democratic uh, demo story of democracy. And uh, I, if I may return back and react to Marketa, what she said, I don't want to protect democracy. And I would probably face Trump. I want to make democracy great again. <laughs> to make it a, a lighthouse, <laughs> that show that this is, the, this is exactly where everybody wants to live. Because this is a society worth spending your thought, energy, and sacrifice uh, for this kind of society more than uh, what we sacrifice at the moment. And uh, last point, it is also about, uh, about output legitimacy, democratic uh, governance system is capable of delivering. And I think this is actually, this is a, a, a struggle we are right now having with China or Russia. Because they claim that they are better on output legitimacy. And that we too much rely on input legitimacy of our system. That we are blind to see that we are failing in delivering to what the people need. In terms of social and economic development, in terms of social justice, in terms of, uh, and please don't, don't crucify me for, for saying, for protecting the way of life the people like. And that's what I understand as uh, building resilience. Maybe if I can just briefly second what, what, what Michal said. I mean, I don't want to take sides here. I don't think there is really a little, so, so some kind of huge controversy, but I, I, I do believe that we should have compassionate <laughs> societies and we should have you know, public institutions that people trust not to defeat Russians, but just because it's, it, it, it's good in itself. Um, but that's, that's, to me, that's quite, that's quite obvious. Uh, but just a, a thought that occurred to me, I mean, and we were operating in this kind of certain th theoretical paradigm and um, I don't mind the concept of resilience as long as it's, it's not purely security because when security is where politics stop, right? That's, well, when we securitize something, we, know we, we close the debate uh, on it. Uh, and I, I think that's not really something that should be part of 
through re truly resilient societies, we need to preserve the space of politics. We need to s preserve the space of dissent, the liberal values. We, we should not be forgetting, and I think, you know, Tomáš, if I, I'm, I'm probably to some extent, you know, rephrasing, you know, what has been said uh, already, you know, we should not forget what is it that we are protecting here, and that, that's liberal values, uh, even if it means that, uh, you know, we we hardly disagree with some some people, and you know it means a lot of gibberish, uh, a lot of noise. Um, it, it's it's that which matters. You know, liberal liberal values and and you know just just societies. Uh, even though I'm moderator, I would actually uh, uh, breach my role and add something maybe to what was said. I, I think this question touches upon two different roles, security might role, or factor of security might role in those building of cohesion, right? I think we are moving between those two within the debate about hybrid warfare, because once it becomes a driving factor, then it starts pushing out the political and, and, and starts to be dangerous because often it will also be tailored to one specific threat and there will be this narrow vision. But at the same time, I would defend the need to consider security as a part of the debate, of everyday debate, even because I would argue that over the last 30 years, in a lot of the fields of discussion, including like social state or the state that cares for its people, security essentially disappeared because we felt totally secure. There was no, there were no serious threats, so there was no reason to debate, to even consider it as a factor worthy of discussion. So I would actually argue that as long as we keep it as one among the factors with the impact on climate change and other impacts of policies and decisions we make every day, then I wouldn't necessarily consider it illiberal. Then again, once the security would be this overbearing, the primary factor which would push out these other considerations, then it would be a problem. So, so, sorry for stepping out from a moderate role for a minute, but I couldn't resist. So, but thank you for an amazing question. So, any more amazing questions? If, if there are none, uh, yeah. I, I, I will. And, and I, I have to react to what Wojciech uh, just said. Look, uh, uh, we are talking about social security system. We are, we are in, in a way, naturally seeing that this is part of our feeling to be, to have some, some safety, some, some security in a changing world. So uh, it is not that uh, it should be a driving force for that, but we cannot uh, avoid probably taking into account that this all has something to do with how we feel secure uh, in the society and uh, in that. And, uh, and we used a long time ago the language of security in terms of social policy and uh, healthcare and others. Since there are no people who have questions, I'll, you know, um, um, I want to add one more thing. It's a very personal observation. Um, in about 2015, 2016, I was playing with the data from one of the Slovak surveys that was done by the um, Slovak Academy of Sciences. And I noticed that about half of people in Slovakia believe in conspiracy theories. And it was 2015, you know, sort of nobody was really paying attention to that at that time, and I had a few chats with people in, uh, in Bratislava, and the answer that you would always get is like, oh my God, these people are idiots, why should, you, sh why should we care about them? Now, six years later, it turns out that, you know, it can literally kill you if you believe in conspiracy theories. Um, like, literally. Even if your neighbor believes in conspiracy theories, it can kill you. So it, it's a societal resilience that we need to care about because being susceptible to believing that there are secret groups of people manipulating the world is a problem. So in that way, we should care about societal resilience, not because you know there is Mr. Putin somewhere. Um, I mean, no, Slovak government is now spending 50 million euro on on building a new center for fighting the hybrid threats and they're going to focus on Russian disinformation. It's a fantastic idea, you know, but like shutting down Facebook is not the only problem that exists in, in our thinking about resilient societies. 
Yes, sir. <laughs> this is a great topic. I love it. <laughs> um, I've actually uh, just been to Taiwan uh, with the uh, committee with long name, uh, in short, uh, regarding disinformation, and uh, we try to learn from them. Because, of course, Taiwan, uh, as a very small country, yes, I said it, <laughs> country, um, it gets a lot of, uh, let's say, influence from, uh, from West Taiwan, also called China. And, uh, <laughs> And there is, uh, uh, therefore, they had to build a lot of societal resilience. Otherwise, of course, they would be destroyed. Because one lucky thing we have here is uh, the difference in languages. Uh, the fact that uh, Russian or Chinese interference uh, is trying to somehow uh, pose a threat here is a little bit blocked by also the fact that uh, not everybody speaks English, and uh, they also don't speak such a good English often. And, uh, Every country has pretty much different language. And uh, uh, however, in case of uh, China and Taiwan, uh, this, is, uh, this is not the case. So they were very sensitive towards it. What they did or what they are doing, apart from, of course, many things that we are talking about, such as you know, trying to talk to the uh, platforms, Facebook, etc., uh, they are actually building trust of the citizens towards the government. Because if you trust your government, then why would you trust that your government is trying to develop AIDS or something. This is not a, a, a joke, this is actually what happened in the US. And uh, it's, uh, it's very visible how it works and how it really brings fruit. Um, their uh, their uh, president and prime minister, they are on TV, on their social media platforms, and they are actually disseminating uh, the biggest disinformation. They are saying, no, it's like that. They are speaking as truthfully as possible, uh, which is also great. They have very transparent uh, government. You can click on you know, a, few, a few clicks gets you to the information you need or you want so it's very easy to fact check anything even if you are from rural rural areas and uh they, uh, for instance, very, very visible, visible example is uh, how they dealt with COVID until I think May. They didn't even have lockdown. They didn't need it, and they had zero cases, which is also because of uh, how they communicated it. Uh, of course, you might say, well, Asians, you know, they were, wore masks anyway. Uh, but this is also about how they believe their government that their steps, what they are doing, uh, make sense. Unimaginable here, right? I don't know if all of you are from the Czech Republic, but um, uh, for those of who are not, we had like four and one rotating uh, ministers of health during the biggest COVID crisis. It's not very trustworthy, is it? And uh, in, uh, in Taiwan, there is five doctors, doctors, not politicians, who are stepping, uh, um, who are going to TV in the main uh, prime time uh, each day and are explaining why some numbers rise, uh, why some numbers are lowered, what are the restrictions, why they are post, etc. Uh, sorry for this prolonged example, but uh, I think that when we are talking about resilience, it's really uh, something you can also do by either electing people who will behave like that and try to bring the trust back to you, or uh, calling upon those who are already in power to try to be more transparent, more open, more trustful in general, uh, and uh, we don't have to, you know, tackle the issue of Russia immediately. This is also about our, um, well, yeah, trying to deal with it at home. Okay. Uh, I think there's a question there. Uh, so if, if you would, who, who has the, yeah, microphone, whatever. Thank you. Yeah. So, unfortunately for you guys, I don't have a question, but I'm, I'm going to pitch in to, uh, to this debate, if I may, because it, it is a, an intriguing question. And I, I actually like to support uh, Michal in his sort of thought of um, when we securitize the issue of resilience through the notion of social cohesion, that this can actually be an illiberal uh, uh, characteristic or an illiberal act, because, because I think what in the extreme case, is that if the state starts securitizing social cohesion and then acts upon this politically, right, at that point it starts sort of prescribing as to how that social cohesion should come about. And it, 
it will start giving prescriptions into what is the good life, right, in terms of what, on what basis the cohesion should take place, right? And in the extreme case, we're approaching what China is doing in the so, you know, harmonious society, building har harmony in a society, and where the Communist Party is telling what this harmony entails, right? So, so we have a top-down sort of dictate in terms of how the society should live, and that's the illiberal component of the securitization of social cohesion. So, so I do agree with uh, uh, all of the, the, the comments on the panel, but I also support Michal in, in the thought of how it can become illiberal, right? Where basically the state is usurping the power to formulate the uh, sort of the good life and how social cohesion should come about, right? So I'm sorry, it's a comment, yeah. And then I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily uh, disagree, or I think it's a good comment at the very least. Uh, I, I think this might, inter actually we can rephrase it as a question, possibly, uh, if you give me a few moments. Um, I, I had a thought about that, what, what you said. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, the question was, <laughs> But it's something that intrigues me, and I think it connects quite well with uh, the comment. Uh, to what degree we are willing to compromise our own positions in building this societal cohesion or cons consensus? Because I think there isn't a problem to reach this idea, okay, we should be cohesive, we should, be, we should build consensus, but there is generally a, per a perception that this consensus should be on our position. Right, and so if Mr. Pesicek is willing to start. I will probably perhaps, um, try to reframe the, the debate because I, uh, I think we are stuck on the term social cohesion. What does it mean? I would instead use then the term social inclusion because what we need is inclusive society because this is part of the story about uh, of resilience. And I agree that uh, uh, it is not that we need to re go towards social inclusion by securitizing it. It has a strong meaning for the society in itself. Even without like any reference point of Russia, China, whatsoever. Okay, maybe if we start using different terminology, it can also help to understand that what is said is not to build a harmonious society, but to build an inclusive society uh, where you tackle existing social problems that put people apart, not in terms of that they have different opinions, that's, that's okay, but that they feel that they are not part of the society at all. And look, look at the polls in the US. Part of Republicans consider uh, Democrats a, a bigger threat than Russia or China. They feel this, uh, this is a different nation, this is a different tribe. They don't talk uh, the same language at the end of the day, probably. And that is probably something we need to, be un need to understand. Uh, so maybe we, let's use different terminology, but uh, I think that the, the meaning what we, what we raise is that uh, we need, for example, to improve the educational system. That is not working well right now. That is not providing for social mobility. Uh, that is part of the story. Because uh, if you know that you are born to a situation you cannot escape, it makes you feel that uh, this is not my society. I'm trying to rather to go for sub-society sub or subgroup that I can identify with rather than with the country uh, I'm living in. But all said, I agree that securitizing resilience uh, is probably not something, something worth of trying to, to do. Uh, on, the other, on the contrary, I would say let's keep resilience as a concept per se and work on it because it is uh, something that creates a better or functioning uh, society that can uh, contribute to our prosperity and social justice. <laughs> I mean, 
this, this is a tremendously important but also difficult question that, that we are trying to tackle here from different perspectives. I, 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 without making any, any false analogies and, and equalities, I think even in democratic liberal societies until quite recently, the consensus, the consent was manufactured to some extent and it was manufactured by, by elites. Uh, and this is, how, this is how we kept on going. Right. But with the democratization of knowledge in particular, I think that this is becoming much more difficult and we are struggling to find ways to, to renew that, that consensus and, and trust that comes with it that allows our societies to, to operate. But it's, it's our job, you know. Uh, of course, it, comes, it creates vulnerabilities that may be exploited by, by people, <laughs> states, that, that want to improve their posi relative position in the, in the international system, but it, it, it's our problem uh, to, to solve in the first case, and not because, again, you know, not, not, not because we want to defend ourselves against Russians. But I don't think also it, it's binary. I mean, with, with Wojciech, we, we did a little bit of a field trip, you know, uh, earlier this year in, in, in Finland, which is given often as kind of almost a model case uh, to <laughs> yeah, to to deal with uh, hybrid, hybrid in interference, and I think what what we observed, and I would be a little bit cautious. I mean, it was just just a field trip, you know, was um, a degree of basic consensus, uh, which allowed for a very productive debate. You know, I mean, it's not like either you have manufactured consent and and no politics, or you you have you know like dissent and and an ability to agree on anything. I don't I don't I, I don't think it's necessarily the case, and I think that Finland case may may be a testimony to that. But also, I mean, what we what we saw there talking to people was like raising the issue of importance of um, you know, information literacy. Uh, but not just to defend against Russian disinformation, but to be a competitive society, to defend against child abuse. I mean, there, there are d different reasons why certain things are, are of value. Uh, and I think it's important to keep in mind and not narrow the debate down. And that is what I fundamentally think is what, uh, what the desecuritization, at least to some extent, of this comes about, comes to be. I, I would just compliment since Andre brought up our trip to Finland. I think one of the most uh, striking thing was, and it, it's a difficult question to judge to what degree this consensus is natural, negotiated, or fabricated. But when we ask them, for example, whether they have some degree of greater political discussion about countering hybrid warfare or threat Russia poses, they were most, most of all looking puzzled, like no, we essentially all parties agree, all people agree, no, no, no reason to discuss this at all. So I would agree with Andre that this is a very different situation from most other countries. And I always contest whether we actually should look at Finnish at such a genius uh, com or, uh, defenders against cyber warfare as I think like if, if we would have society as Finland's and we would be in a position of Finland, we would probably Finland and we would also defend well. It's not just that they have such a great idea, that it's, just, it's plausible for them to implement it. Uh, so, any more questions from audience or even comments if, if someone wants to join discussion? Yeah, just, just on a microphone for the benefit of uh, I, I will not respond. I, th thanks a lot for the, all these comments. And I think uh, I'm, what is just intriguing you know, for me is that the conference is called The World Turning Dangerous. This is a panel on a hybrid warfare, you know, on Russia, East-West relations. And we are talking about social policy, right? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that this is bad. I think this is right. I'm just saying that it signals something like a paradigm shift in the debate, at least in this room. I'm not saying that we are forming the paradigm around, but it would be cool, I mean. <laughs> but I mean, I'm just highlighting what a change in the mindset of people in, interested in these things this is, right? I mean, that's, that's how I read it. I mean, 20 years ago, we were talking about terrorism, about all these kind of new threats, and it was completely different perception of uh, where the, the, the future of uh, security of nations is, right? So we are now back uh, to good old Bismarck, kind of building domestic resilience, introducing social policy measures to make sure that you are strong enough vis-a-vis -vis your uh, external counterparts. So anyway, just thanks a lot for the comments. I hope this is not a final word, but I hope I want to add that I think this is a result of the shift when it comes to foreign policy from, permi you know, permissive consensus to constraining dissensus. 
Uh, people suddenly have, I was once at a lecture at Stanford where Niall Ferguson said, before every village had an idiot, and now these idiots can talk to one another. And I think that's a very dismissive way of talking to one another, uh, to, about um, the census about foreign policy. But I do think that advances in many modern technologies have made people aware that, or have increased the salience of descending voices, also when it comes to foreign policy. And not all of these descending voices are equally well informed and formed overall. So in that view, I think that might be a result of changing nature of policy. That's why we need to talk about social policy. Okay, so any more comments, contributions, or comments upon discussion? One more. Um, perhaps, I don't, I don't know if I have that question structured correctly, but you guys talked about um, education being the form of uh, reaching a more uh, inclusive society, uh, government uh, being more transparent and effective in reaching the populace and the populace being uh, more uh, devoted in voting and stuff, and then the individual being uh, more involved in the whole process um, in order to you know, uh, unify the society. Uh, can you think of any other groups or institutions which could aid in this process? Because it's a it's a complicated question, and just I don't know. I, I keep on hearing the question or the concept of education solving all problems, but it seems that this concept has been around for since always, and uh, not much is changing. And it's I don't think a simple reform could change it. Perhaps there is a wider cultural uh, problem that is not being addressed. I don't know. If I may, I'm not sure whether I will be answering directly the question, but I think it's a nice uh, uh, thinking point. I, um, I personally, and it's just personal opinion, do think that what would help, and I was very glad that Andre mentioned the thing with the elites, uh, always setting the agenda and the direction, and people kind of going you know, behind, because we are not that much used to democracy. I think that part of democracy are also communities, uh, and it can be within regions, it can be based on ideology, uh, whatever. Uh, and it's not, not about division, it's more more about um, uh, taking care of each other and, uh, well, showing the compassion and also uh, informing each other. Uh, what I mean by that is that I think that currently uh, the national states are not functioning anymore as they did in the past, and it's not like their fault, it's just a shift in the whole paradigm and in the, uh, in the world. And they are very, um, uh, very uh, well, uh, stiff in uh, adapting to the new world. And I do think that uh, national states should kind of step back a little bit and let people also um, form some kind of uh, communities, for, form their own paradigms. Uh, I would use an example, and maybe it's a controversial example here, I don't know. Uh, let's spice up the debate for, for the last part. Um, uh, for instance, the, the Catalonians, uh, of course, it's a question of, uh, of uh, some sovereignty and uh, much bigger than, than just some, some regional identity. But I do think that if the national state just kind of step back and look at what, uh, what the this part of their uh, like country wants, or this part uh, wants, then, and if this, is, this was applied to every part and every region, that they would thrive more together. And of course, then they would be also more resilient together. Um, of course, there always needs to be something that uh, kind of uh, creates an umbrella of protection over this. And up until now, it were national states. And I do think they can continue doing so, or they can pull their capabilities, as I mentioned, you know. And uh, now I'm going into the controversial part with the European Federation of Regions. Um, but uh, 
I uh, I do think that again this is a this is a direction. This, let's let's consider it a, a brainstorming about how we can improve our democracies. And I think that not clinging onto the elites and just the national states and the parliaments is one way because of course they are uh, our representatives in our representative democracies. But also we can see that it's uh, not working as well as uh, as it was in the past, and we should think about why. I think there are much more. Uh, there are there are that uh, uh, we should uh, discuss about not only education or uh, the way people participate, uh, how the state works. Uh, but uh, I forgot what I wanted to say actually, because I I, I I saw why in the sci-fi movies you always have uh, monarchy or uh, imperi imp imperium. Uh, the, like, how is it that we, we ourselves consider that the future will be less free than, uh, than the current state? And probably that leads me to the, to the point I wanted to raise. And uh, it's a little bit a reaction to Michael Michal's comment that uh, we are certainly, uh, certainly living in a period where a lot of uh, uh, paradigms will be uh, changed. Um, and I would refer to Jeremy Rifkin, who speaks about the third industrial revolution and the age of uh, resilience uh, as a kind of like future uh, period that uh, will define probably the next hundred years. And uh, I think that the, the part of the story is that, uh, that we, are al we are anxious about the future. People are in general generally anxious what the future will bring them and they don't have um, right answers right now. I, I wouldn't blame only some algorithms of Facebook uh, for what we are facing too. Look, uh, uh, a couple of hundred years ago, uh, there was new technology in Europe uh, called uh, uh, print, and it caused 100 years of havoc in Europe. Uh, but it was not uh, the print itself, it was uh, the way the society was already uh, probably ready uh, for this clash uh, that allowed for some future uh, future developments. So now I think that what we are now currently facing and uh, what probably is answered to, to both questions, that we are reconsidering what does it mean to feel safe in a world that is less and less predictable for us because uh, we are facing uh, such a deep structural changes in terms of how we communicate, uh, how our economy is going to orga be organized, uh, how our uh, societies uh, probably will be governed, that uh, we don't know how to approach all this uh, spectrum, a huge spectrum of, uh, of challenges uh, by not trying to figure out uh, absolutely new paradigms like resilience, for example. It doesn't mean that we are trying to securitize it, but we are trying to, to probably catch what the future is going to be about <laughs> and what our role is going to be in the future. Like, it is not always uh, done that the uh, Bible is only a couple of times on the air souls and, and the free will is not uh, here uh, forever, probably. <laughs> By the way, a huge, huge amount of disinformation enabled by the printing press in the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century. No, I mean, <laughs> just quickly, I mean, I, I think participation here is, is key. Uh, I mean, and we probably should try really to harness the, the technology that, that we have that can be used, of course, in ways that are detrimental to, you know, to social cohesion, but also that enable new forms of participation. And I think that's the way to, to restore the legitimacy of the political institutions that we have, which is not to say that it's something really easy. OK, so I would, as this was the last question, because we ran out of time and we filled, to my surprise, the whole two hours. And uh, I'm sorry if we disappointed by shifting discussion to too much to social issues. I will consider it as either my failure or my success as a moderator. 
Uh, I would like to thank very much all of our panelists for uh, traveling to Prague to participate in the event and for their contributions. I'm very happy that we reached a point where we were not only violently agreeing with each other, but there was a discussion on a lot of things with the help of the public. So thank you very much, and I would yield the floor to Michal Smetana, uh, who should have, if I remember the program correctly, concluded word. It won't take much longer. So, uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> it's, it's probably easier to, uh, so that I can face the, the rest of the audience. Thank you so much for an excellent discussion. This was uh, great. And yeah, I consider it to be a big strength that we actually came to these issues uh, towards the end. And I believe that we could probably sit here for well, for way longer to discuss these issues, and it would get even more complex in time. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you see the title of the second panel, which has a word warfare in it, and we, we can see how we are actually able to consistently shift from topics like NATO and EU common uh, foreign and security policy and strategic documents and get to things exactly like what you mentioned, social cohesion, social policy, education, trust, everyday use of technology, and this is, yeah, I mean, just to somehow conclude it, you know, this is maybe one of the points why we established uh, PRCP and what is behind it, because we wanted to establish interdisciplinary research center because we, as many others, understand that issues in interest relations and security studies, which is my own background, this is what I studied and that I know most, cannot be today like properly studied without considering these other perspectives. This is why I have been learning so much in the past four years since we established PRCP from my colleagues, psychologists and sociologists and economists, because this is really helping not me and my colleagues and others to you know, open up and try to understand these uh, issues from a much more complex perspective, and probably we cannot do it in another, another way today. So. This is extremely uh, important and will be in future, and I promise that we will come back to the problem of hybrid Russia disinformation in future, and I don't think that this will be solved very soon to, uh, to, to, for this topic to stop being attractive for us as academics and scholars and experts and, and even just you know citizens. So, uh, so that's for sure. Uh, let me just use this opportunity to express my gratitude to a few people that made this conference happen. Uh, this is uh, this is really uh, really the point that I want to stress because uh, I was. Uh, I and my colleagues moderators were not the only ones uh, behind it. First and foremost, I would like to thank my PRCP colleagues, mainly Marushka and Bara in the back, because they, these two were the, the ones that actually did the hard work of organizing a conference. Bara mainly with the PR and Marushka with all the logistics and, and stuff behind it. So thank you so much. This was extremely helpful. And yeah, I'm extremely happy that we are such a good team to, to make this happen and without uh, uh, okay, with a lot of stress, but maybe <laughs> maybe still uh, still enjoying it and having uh, having a lot of fun working on it. Second of all, and uh, very important, I would like to thank uh, Political Science Club and Common Law Society. Uh, yeah, to quote a classic, I think this is a beginning of a beautiful friendship. You guys helped us uh, helped us a lot, and uh, and I hope we can work together on some other events. I think we already uh, worked with a few ideas during preparations for this one, so uh, hopefully this will be a teamwork again. This uh, this this was perfect. Of course, big thanks to our moderators and our speakers this, who provided us with a plenty of food for thought also for the next weeks. I'm a little bit afraid, I was discussing today with many other people that this might be the last physical event for at least a few weeks or maybe a couple of months. So I'm glad we managed to do it maybe in the last minutes, at least in this very limited space, but at least somehow. And yeah, thank you all of you in the audience for coming. This is great. Keep. Uh, keep looking at our social networks and our website to get some information about uh, about our future events, uh, whether they will be online or physically. We would love to see you again and get, get involved and mainly stay safe and healthy. So thank you so much and see you very soon.